Well, folks, you know you're in for a treat when you hear that tune because it's time for another week of the Rec Poker Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Reed, Bluff Storini in the home game and at Rec Poker Jim on Twitter. And I have the best freaking job in the world talking poker with my friends here on the forums edition of the podcast every Monday night while we steal each other's chips in the free nightly home game. Now, we're going to take a look at a post from our free strategy forums in just a moment. But first, I have to thank our sponsors, the Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack, and Casino. Most of what we do here is free. We're a largely volunteer-based organization. So we depend on support from our sponsors and also from our premium members who take part in our training material and study opportunities for only 15 bucks a month. We've got a couple premium members I'm going to introduce you to a little later in the show. So thank you to them. Um, for their support. And if you're thinking about taking the plunge out there, I'd remind you that if you use the code RECPOKER at checkout, you can get your first month for only $5. And, you know, here at Rec Poker, we play for fun, but it's more fun when you win. So we study together, we play together, we celebrate together. And it all starts with a free membership at rec.poker, where all it takes to join is an email address and a smile. Now, they let me host the show on Mondays, but I'm just one man. It takes a group, a gang, a village, a crew to make all the magic happen here. We call this group of wizards the Wrecking Crew. And if you want to learn more about me or the rest of the Wrecking Crew, you can head on over to rec.poker slash crew. But you can also just listen up because you're going to meet a few of them here tonight on the show, starting with the one and only producing co-host, Chris Jones. I'm Chris Jones. You can find me 5b5 on Twitter or 5x5 in the Poker Stars home game. I'm uh, Rob Washam, and you can find me as Rabman50 just about everywhere. I'm Taylor Moss. You can find me on Twitter at Taylor underscore Moss, or as Gopher Boy TJM in the Rec Poker home game. You can also find Taylor uh, at the final table of most tournaments happening in Minnesota uh, in the month of November and December. Uh, or Taylor's on the internet. I mean, you just wherever he, wherever he enters, it just doesn't yeah. doesn't even have to. It's not exclusive to Minnesota. No, it's true. Is Taylor's it, isn't that screen. the goal? Yeah, pretty much. It is. It is. You're not you're not wrong, Taylor. Uh, so congratulations on your excellent results recently, sir. Um, and then I mentioned a couple of premium members that we have in the room here tonight. I love it when our premium members come and join the show in real time and lend their own thoughts and insights uh, to the to conversation. First, I'm going to introduce uh, Bob Franklin, who I had the pleasure of meeting at the Run Good event down in Iowa. Uh, Bob, thanks for coming on the show. Where can folks find you if they want to get a little more Bob Franklin in their lives? Um, I'm on Twitter. On uh, It's uh, under Bob the Turn. I believe it's one, two, three, four. And then uh, I also play mostly online. So I'm going to be joining your home games. Um, it'll be Bob the Turner there. And then I play on ACR as well as River Wrangler. Right on the River Wrangler. We got him. We wrangled him in here into the uh, forums edition of the podcast. And uh, Steve Catterson's joining us, another one of our new premium members. You might know him by his handle, the Chip Extractor. So it's been exciting to uh, see Steve get more and more involved in Rec Poker. Steve, why don't you introduce yourself to our audience here and say hi? Yeah, so uh, Steve Catterson is my name. Chip Extractor is uh, what I go by everywhere. Uh, Twitter, X, Instagram, Gmail, uh, any of the above, you can find me on there. And uh, I'm glad to be uh, glad to be part of the community now. Right on, man. Well, like I said, thanks to both of you for your support. It means the world to us to have you on the team here. And I'm looking forward to uh, talking to you here on the forums edition of the podcast. So every week uh, we take a look at a, a free post for our a post from our free strategy forums. This week we're looking at one by Keith Brandt. You know him as Monkey System, a longtime Wrecking Crew member here. The title of the post is Nut Flush Draw on the Turn in a Three-Way Pot. And we'll put the link in the show notes. If you're listening now, feel free to just click that link. You can view the post for free. You don't need to be signed in or anything like that and follow yeah. along. So this spot came up in a recent $600 tournament in Chicago. We get dealt Ace of Hearts, Jack of Hearts in middle position and open to about 2.25 big blinds. The button's been cold calling a lot and V-pipping 40% or more, they call, and the big blind calls. The effective stack is about 50 big blinds. So there's about 10 big blinds in the pot, a little less. The flop comes 10 of hearts, 
seven of diamonds, four of clubs. The big blind checks. And Keith's question is, first, what is our action in this three-way pot? We've got two overs, a backdoor straight, and a backdoor flush. And uh, Keith says, if I were heads up against the big blind, I'm c-betting all day. If we're heads up against the active button, I'm probably c-betting because against this player, I have the range advantage. But three-way is more likely that one of them hit this flop and isn't going to fold to the c-bet. We check and the button checks behind. Does anyone want to talk about the flop action um, or should I just continue talking, Taylor? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think it's definitely important to talk about flop action. Uh, I feel like there's a lot of people that either over C-bet or under C-bet. And I feel like this is a classic spot for a lot of people to over C-bet, uh, you know, kind of like relatively low board. We still have some overs and we're just going to, you know, keep firing uh, with everything that we open with. And that's not really like the case. Uh, button, I know they mentioned them as, you know, kind of V-pipping a lot, um, which a lot of people are like, oh, you know, it's weak holdings then, you know, they have a weak hand, we should get them off the hand. Well, it just means they're playing and have a very wide range, which this flop can or cannot connect with. And, you know, you're going to have a tough spot navigating uh, from this. So honestly, given that they're the button, all these other types of things, the fact that there's one heart out there. Uh, I think definitely makes the case that we should just be checking here. And to be clear, I'm honestly checking with the intention of calling. Like I still feel like we're in an all right spot, um, but I don't really want to be the one taking the aggressive action. I'd rather, if I can, go check, check here and then play a turn with my high card equity uh, versus the other two ranges and just kind of like play it from there. Chris? Yeah, I mean, and I just would echo that because I, I I feel like this is a spot. Um, I've been trying to do a lot of multi-way study lately. Um, and this is like the classic situation where we find ourselves um, having opened, having an in-position player call us and an out-of-position player call us. We're sandwiched in the middle. Both of those players, once that out-of-position player checks to us and it's on us, both of those players are still uncapped. Because that that out of position player should almost never be leading in this dynamic in this spot. Um, so we are actually in what probably one of the the worst positions here to lead out, and it means that when we do lead, we need to have a very strong range when we do so, and we are incentivized to check a ton in these spots. Um, the other thing that checking does for us is it gives us a lot, so much information by the time we reach a turn because the in position player um has to make a, a decision then and when they elect not to bet that then caps their range significantly um and so it's a it, this is a much more comfortable spot to play through a check call uh rather than through uh some kind of c bet thing and and i think so many players get into the well you know it's it's a it's a 10 7 4 flop i usually see bet on these kind of flops i've got two overs backdoor flush backdoor straight um this feels like a good hand to continue with and represent you know some of the stronger holdings i have in my range but this is a really classically good hand to check here and i like the way you talk about having a lot more information i mean the next time you get to act you'll have seen the out of position player act twice as well. And uh, they're going to be a check there does weaken their range uh, more than just checking the flop. Like you say, uh, yep. Rob, did you have something there? Yeah. I just want to agree with both Chris and Taylor that I don't believe this is a spot where we want to see bet, but I do disagree that they're uncapped because they both just called. I believe they're that caps their range. So they're going to have a more, linear range probably they're not going to be they're not going to have an uncapped range because they're not going to have aces kings ace king those types of hands so i think what we're talking about is the difference between range advantage and nut advantage mm. so um by the fact that they checked um might lessen the amount of times that they have something like pocket sevens to have the actual nuts on this on this flopper 
Or was it tens? I can't remember. Yeah, ten, seven, four. So ten, yeah. seven. Okay, so uh, yeah, a set of tens or a set of sevens would be more nut advantage type hands. Ten, seven is there. Those types of hands exist, but the big hands, the aces, kings, queens, they're all they're not there because they would have three yep. bet those yeah. to begin with. Yeah, when I when I when I say I mean I mean the absolute best hands that they can possibly have here. Uh, the, given the two given pairs, the, board. the sets. Yeah. Um, right. those kinds of things are still well within their range, right? For right. the most part, yep. less the yep. buttons, more the big blind. Yeah, and then the other thing that I really like checking here for is if I'm thinking about how I'm going to play the turn in instances where it goes check check, um, and this will kind of give away like what my approach would be on the turn, but like when it goes check check and then a turn card comes out like. I'm going to be betting big on any Broadway card, uh, including a 10 that comes out uh, or any heart. And my hand does really well with all those different things with ace Jack, like an, an ace or Jack comes out. I now have top pair. That's easy for me to bet big with If a king or queen comes out. I have uh, a gut shot draw plus others should be relatively scared of me having a king or queen in my hand because I have these types of holdings. So it's going to be very credible for us to like lead big there and be able to take it down with just our gut shot. Uh, and then likewise with a heart, like a heart, we're going to get added equity there uh, and it's going to allow us to bet big. So I really like the option of checking here to be able to bet big on so many of those turn cards. Uh, and then a lot of the other cards that just kind of completely whiff, um, I will just be trying to like check down and see if a sign might be good in those situations. But I, I'm thinking forward, like I want to understand how I'm going to play turn cards. Because I think the tough part here, if you do see that and you get called, what are you going to do on the turn? And what mm -hmm. turn cards are good for you? And like, are you going to continue that route when a king or a queen comes out? Um, or how are you going to approach those different situations? I feel like it gets way muddier uh, when you see that here, trying to decide what you're going to do on turns. Yep, that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, Bob, you unmuted. Uh, what's on your mind? So, Mike, I guess my question here, I, I see this is a tournament in Chicago and it's a live game. So if this was online, would you play it the same way? Oh, great question. Yeah. So, um, Chris, I'm going to ask you first because you talked about sort of some of the reasons why you might or might not see bet. Um, seemed like a lot of that was tied into the fact that it's multi-way and that these players can still have a lot of very strong hands here given the run out. Um, what, what, what would change if you were playing online versus live? I'd, I'd be more likely to check online. Um, I feel like my opponents are going to have um, m probably more, ex just more sound ranges mm. um, and um, are going to be able to perform really well if I bet here. Um, you know, if I was in a live tournament and I really had a sense that these players were wildly out of line, like super passive, calling all the time to see flops, only continuing when they've really smashed it kind of thing. You know, you, you know the kind of live tournament player I'm talking about. I still like a check here, but I think I'd be more, more, I could be talked into a bet in that, in that sort of situation. Let, let me take us, oh, here, Steve, you had something. Yeah, so I guess I'm going to be the I'm going to be the contrarian in the group. Do it. We love it. We love contrarians. <laughs> uh, just, just here. honestly, just for devil's advocate purposes, I think that I you can make an argument for for C betting here. I think it's interesting that Taylor mentioned all those cards that we're going to bet turn on because if you think about all those over cards or I'm sorry, Broadway cards and and. Uh, Parts that come in on the turn that gives us a lot of barreling opportunity if we do uh, see bet on the flop. The other thing is if we see bet the flop, um, I think we get a ton more clarity on on our opponent's ranges and and they're going to be essentially under pairs to the ten. Um, and when we do have those barreling opportunities, we're going to be able to get a lot of those hands to fold, especially when we size up on the turn. Um, now. This is a tournament with 50 big blinds. So I think in this instance, I would check a lot. And I agree with everything that everybody said. I do think that there is 
um, some value in exploring what the bet line looks like, uh, mm-hmm. especially mm-hmm. especially as it leads to turns and and uh, barrel possibilities, and what cards you do and do not want to size up and barrel on turn, um, and then follow through on river. Um, but I do I do like the idea in. Now, keep in mind, I'm coming from a, a deep stack cash game background, so I do like the idea of uh, defaulting to the aggressive action when I feel I can play that line well through multiple streets post-flop. Um, and I think like this is a somewhat in-betweener for me. In the tournament, I would mm. I would certainly check here, and as described in this uh, example, I would check. But I do think that um, when you explore this and you're thinking about like where you want to go in, in this spot, um, definitely thinking about what the aggressive line looks like across multiple streets uh, can give you an idea of maybe adding that aggression in spots where you might default to passivity. Um, and then that kind of opens up your game maybe a little bit more. Yeah, and I do like this idea that even if we feel like there's a pat answer that we are comfortable with, um, examining the alternatives. Because even if if you know that checking is you know a profitable play, um, it might you should always be comparing it to the the V of the other players. So I love that we've got an open mind for that. Taylor? Yeah, I, I'd like to comment on one of them because uh, you said one thing kind of like you kind of get to understand your opponent's range a, a little bit better when you bet. Uh, I think you can understand it just as equally well if you check uh, and kind of see how they're going to react to it because you're going to still get that like level of information. Uh, so I think there's still some value there in terms of like checking. Um I'd also say, I think like Chris was describing earlier, I think this is just like generally speaking a spot where we should not be C betting a lot. Like forget the, like our exact hand that we have here. Like, I just Mm. think this is like a situation in general where we probably don't want to be C betting a lot. And then like potentially how you come in with the other construction of your range in terms of like what you should be betting versus what you should not be betting and checking and what you're going to be betting as a bluff. Like, I feel like this one's going to fall like squarely in the middle of like your middle-ish value hands, which I think makes it a great uh, check candidate. And then the last thing I'd say is um, when we're talking about the range construction and like where, like, what do we know about people's ranges and like, where are they at with different things? I think if we check and we get check behinds, uh, we obviously keep their range extremely wide, but it's also a range that's really wide that allows us to barrel on those cards and get folds out of. Like we're going to keep a lot of their junk in there that we can then attack and get folds out of. Whereas if we bet and then one of those cards come out that wants us to keep barreling, well, we've already condensed their range to stronger holdings. And now we're trying to get that range that our opponent has that has stronger holdings to try and fold in those spots so it's going to make it a less profitable bluff on the turn so those are kind of the reasons why i'm like advocating for this but i totally get like we should be understanding those different pieces like hey when aggression works like just use aggression but we can't always just like blindly get into pots and just say yep the answer on the flop is bet and the answer on the turn is bet and the answer on the river is bet because you just need your opponents to fold have you been reading my book? Because that's my only strategy in these games. You're not supposed yeah, to bet every street and try and I, try and get. I others. commented your rough draft uh, a bunch there, Jim. <laughs> I, I think you need to go back to the drawing board. Uh, Chris, what have you got to say? Yeah, and one one of the other really uh, things to keep in mind um, in multi way pots, and especially in this situation, is that, and one of the reasons that I think this is such a strong check is that we need to divide our range into three. Cl- sort of classes of hands right Mm. the ones that we're betting for value right now and that i think needs to be very strong value as well as the ones we're sort of maybe leading out that are sort of more like kind of our drawy bluffy type hands we also need to have hands that are value that we're checking that we are planning to check raise so it really actually weakens our ability to bet with the the bulk of our strength and value. And it's another reason why checking is so valuable here is because we need to be able to, when we check here, have the ability because we still have a player, two players who are going to get to act behind us before we ever get to act again. And we have to have something in our, our, our checking range that can protect that the the fact that we've checked and if we just if we just check with our absolute garbage here we're going to be in some trouble and this is a really attractive it's got a it's ace high it's got all these backdoor draws 
it's a really attractive one. And and in, if I was going to be betting here, I would be betting with some very strong value, probably some things like um, some of my some of my over pairs and sets might be betting here. And mm-hmm. then I might turn some of my like gut shot. Really? If I had some really weak gut shots on this kind of board, that might be another one because those are ones that I am potentially comfortable folding to further aggression behind me. Whereas this is a hand I really don't want. I don't want to bet and then have to fold this hand because I feel like it's got too much value, but I'm going to have to fold if I get raised um, in this spot. And that's another reason why I like this check. And so like, I would be, I would be, for instance, if I had, you know, Jack nine of spades on this board, that's the I hand that, I was going to suggest. That would yeah. be a really attractive potential bet here because now I can get better hands that I'm currently holding to fold. Um, and I'm 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 actually doing some value with my bets. Whereas I feel like if I bet here with an ace jack here, I feel like I'm I'm kind of stuck in a really ugly situation if if I don't get those folds. Um, and that's that's another reason why I think this is a really strong hand to check. And, and Chris, you're saying, and I think that this is echoing a sentiment from earlier, that we actually have too much equity to bet here because we uh, would pr- it's better as a check call line, whereas we can take a hand like Jack Nine suited, Jack Eight suited, a gut shot with no flush draw. Um, where if we get raised, we don't mind giving it up yeah. because we don't have and, as much equity. In the and hand. Just to emphasize that hap- this happens a ton in this like exact situation where we are in the middle behind between these two players. This is where we are. They have the most pressure on us to find the, the most checks, especially on boards like this one, where it's not if it's like ace king five or something. Then we can mm-hmm. talk about some different approaches there, but this this board is is a really tough one to play. And Chris, if I remember correctly, your deep dive on the multi way subject this was a sandwich uh, scenario, sandwich spot, and this is where you don't. I don't know if other people call it that. That's what I call it. Yeah, we're we're in the middle of two loaves of bread. I, I get that. Uh, Steve, what do you have to say? So I love the example of the of the Jack Nine. I think. Chris kind of nails it right there. I I was actually going to follow up with a question like, where do you reach out behind your sort of fat value here? Um, Because I do think that there's a propensity for people to um, play too snug in multi-way pots. Now, once again, Mm. I'm going to say this is, this is sort of from my background of live cash. And and I do think the dynamic is different in a, in a tournament where your chips are just that much more valuable. So you can't, you know, kind of get too far out of line um, from, from solid construction there, but uh, reaching for hands that that have some playability uh, across multiple streets is something I do a lot in cash games, and I think maybe I overdo it in tournament games. And this is, uh, to me, this conversation highlights uh, that type of thinking in my mind and how I'm looking for hands to sort of be able to put a lot of pressure on what I perceive to be well-defined ranges across multiple streets and sort of like middling value that I can, you know, wrap top of range against. Um, I wonder if you could just comment specifically on that way of thinking and sort of its value or, or its lack of value in tournaments as opposed to deeper stack, stack cash games. I'll defer to, uh, to one of the other panelists here, whoever unmutes first, Taylor. Yeah, I, I mean, generally speaking, like cash games, you're playing like way deeper. Uh, and like a lot of value comes from like implied odds of those like strong draws or being able to hit high pairs and uh, different things like that. In tournaments, like chips are just like so valuable and like preserving them is so valuable that like we're playing an effective stack of 50 big blinds. I think a lot of the things that we're like kind of talking about that we haven't explicitly said is like, Hey, is this like a three barrel bluff type of spot? Because if we see bet here, like we're kind of going down that path of potentially three barrel bluffing. And if we three barrel bluff our 50 big blinds are getting in the middle here. Uh, And like, is that something that we want to do in a tournament, especially early or mid stages? Like 
ICM and all these things are just going to essentially say like, no, like don't do that. Like it's not really worth the gamble, especially just trying to hope that your opponent's going to fold something out because they are putting you on or like they're, they may put you on, you know, those aces, Kings, Queens types of hands. Like sure you can have those, but you're not going to have them all the time. Uh, so like chip preservation is probably a huge thing here that I think really like benefits us like checking because we don't really like a 10, seven, four flop with ACE Jack with a backdoor flush draw. Like why are we excited about the potential of this being, you know, an all in <laughs> type of spot for us? Like we're not in a cash game. Okay. Maybe, you know, like you've got some equity, like put the hands in the range. Like maybe you've got like 35% equity versus these three people. And like, that's going to be fine. And yeah, sure. Like let's run the equity, but like tournaments do run like very different where you just, you have to preserve that chip stack. And I know the question is about a nut flush draw on the turn, but um, we're I, I'm gonna I'm gonna put one more rabbit hole out there before we even get to the turn here. Um, so we we've we talked about a couple semi bluff hands that we might bet here. What's the worst hand that we value bet here? Ten seven four rainbow. Is it? I it, I don't think we're betting. I don't know a seven. Um, we're probably betting some tens though, right? Do, are we more likely to bet a hand like 10 Jack or? I think that's about right. I, I think where I would probably define my value betting range would probably stop somewhere around queen 10. And mm -hmm. is that in there? Is it not? I don't know, but that's just my initial reaction is somewhere around queen 10. Rob. I. Yep. I personally would probably bet my nines and eights there. Mm -hmm. um that would be a place that i would bet um probably get a call and be pretty pretty happy about it um i'm really not sure what i'd do if i got raised i think i'd still have to call because <laughs> i still have a lot of equity but i think eights or nines there are definitely a bet yeah you're also blocking a lot of the straight combos that your opponent might have in that spot so you'd that's interesting because it does it does inflate the value portion of the raising range a little bit if you're blocking some of those natural uh, draw candidates. Okay, thank you for uh, exploring that with me. On to the turn. So the turn, uh, there's still about 10 big blinds in the middle because it did go check, check, check. The two of hearts. So the board is 10 of hearts, seven of diamonds, four of clubs, two of hearts. So now we've still got two overs and the flush draw. The big blind checks. We now have the flush draw, but only one card to come. Do you think it's very likely, and this is uh, our hero, Keith, um, our correspondent asks, do you think it's very likely one of our opponents has something that won't fold to a turn bet? One of them could be in check call mode with a pair. A semi-bluff depends on fold equity, and we likely don't have very much of that in this three-way pot. Um, so he asks, what is our action? And I want to know if the group agrees with that. Uh, Chris, you unmuted first. Yeah, I think this is where this hand for me, like, I love this flop check and I don't think enough players do it, hmm. but, but, uh, I think like Taylor was saying, I think that we have to have a plan. Um, we can argue about if the turn is a 10, but I think that if the turn is anything, <laughs> uh, Jack queen, King ACE or any heart, I think we have to be betting when this action takes place because now our two opponents have taken actions that have indicated that they don't have that. Yes, they could be sitting there with a seven or a four, right? They likely don't have a 10, but we can start to put a lot of pressure on those types of holdings. Um, and one of the things that um, he says is, is a semi bluff depends on a lot of fold equity and we likely don't have very much. Well, why do we think that? I think mm -hmm. we have, a, we, I the, our opponents have taken no action that me that signifies that they have anything that's interested in this pot. Um, we have not bet and they have not, uh, you know, come along or anything. I think we have a ton of fold equity and when called, we have a ton of equity. Um, so I think we have to bet, we have to bet big here. Um, and, um, this is this this is this is why we checked, right? We checked to get in this spot because we got to learn so much about 
our in position player checking back means that, that they're capping their range there. And then when the, that out of position player that we said that doesn't tell us much when they check on the flop, but when they check on the turn, that tells us a lot more about their holding as well. So I, I think this is the spot where, where we just, we, we almost just have, I mean, we just have to bet this. We have to bet this. And we have to bet big, <laughs> in my opinion. And I, I want to reinforce um, like what Chris is saying is that like, this is why we check. It's a value check on the flop uh, because you get a chance to express some um, strength here. And when they don't take the action, I think that really does weaken both of their ranges. And the reason that the sizing is so important, Keith is right that a lot of their holdings that didn't completely miss are one pair hands. Um, but one pair hands are put in the blender when you use a large size. If you use a small sizing, it's very simple for them to just check and call. And it's an easy, trivial decision. We want to avoid giving our opponents easy and trivial decisions. So we size up in spots like this so that a one pair hand is really put to a difficult decision. Um, so I, I agree with that 100%. Um, and yeah, that was the one thing I want to challenge was that assumption that just because you've now gotten to the turn, their ranges are stronger, but it's just gone check. You haven't actually had it. You haven't actually uh, put them to a decision yet. Um, is there anything else that we, does anyone else want to jump in there, Rob? No, I was just going to agree with Chris. I think uh, we need to bet this turn and we need to bet it big. Now, the way the hand played out, he, he, um, he checked. And the button that popped. Mm -hmm. So what does he think the button is doing that with? Because the two did not help the button. <laughs> yeah, the two let's, is like uh, a blank. It's like a blank. Unless he's sitting there with uh, a hand like Jack Eight of Hearts or something. But I think even that he bets on the, you know, when it's checked to him, he's got to bet that on the, on the flop. So I just. You know, I don't know that I could fold, even mm. if I checked and the guy bet. I don't think I could fold. I think I'd have to continue with this hand somehow. I just it's something something is wrong here. Why is he betting? The only reason he's <laughs> betting is he, because everybody checked twice in front of him. Right. So he figured this is a great spot to just steal this hand. And he could still be ahead of everybody in this hand right now. So I know Taylor's got something, but yeah, let's let's just uh, get to this point here. So um, we, the hero does check and the big blind bets pot, sorry, the button bets, uh, bets pot, the big blind folds and it comes around to us. And to move on to this next decision point, Keith says, uh, we don't have the expressed odds to make this call. The implied odds aren't looking good either because it's hard to realize implied odds from a flush or an ace, I guess, because they'll be obvious on the board. Um, a check raise could be committing ourselves to the pot with a draw and might need to be a jam based on the stack to pot ratio. What is our action now that the pot is finally heads up? Uh, Taylor, what did you have to add? Yeah. And I mean, we said like, essentially this doesn't make sense. One, it's a huge bet. Uh, so they're going polar with their range, essentially, like essentially saying like, I've got a very strong hand or I've got nothing. Um, and for it to follow through with that, the reason Rob is saying it doesn't make sense is like they check flop. They bet a lot of their like medium -ish strength hands on the flop and then, uh, but they took a check route. So they would have to have something that either was super trappy uh, on the flop where they were going to check and try and trap us later uh, and then wake up on the turn or something that had medium value before that was check worthy that now has gone into like premium status with this turn. Um, so pocket deuces make sense. Uh, we have, you know, an opponent who's, you know, V pipping a lot. They could see a pocket pair and just go set mining. Uh, and then now they finally hit that. Uh, it doesn't really make too much sense to me that they would have, you know, pocket fours, probably not pocket sevens. Maybe they had pocket tens and they were getting that super trappiness, but like, there really isn't much that makes sense here. A lot of the two pair combos just don't make sense from a starting point. You know, the seven deuce, the mm -hmm. four deuce. Um, granted, it could be. Um, but all those things considered where I have a really hard time trying to figure out what is their value portion of the range. And that value portion is really small. 
Um, makes me want to call here, even with ace high, because ace high is going to beat a lot of their bluffs. So the fact that we're talking a bunch about implied odds of what happens when we hit our nut draw, uh, we may have more equity than just that. Like ace high may be good in some of these spots. Granted, we're going to be put in really tough spots on rivers in the sense of potentially trying to call down with ace high. So that that's another thing to be considered here. Um, but what happens with an, an ace or a jack comes on the river too, right? Mm-hmm. Like, do we feel pretty good there? Again, it's going to be a really tough call down and a really uncomfortable spot for us to make. But at the same time, we are having a really tough time putting together our opponent's story and trying to figure out what they're going to have here. So uh, as it's played, uh, one, I am uncomfortable, but I am like getting to the point where I'm like, hey, given this player description that we have in terms of they play a lot of hands, uh, they could be doing this with a lot of different things. This might be a time to just call down and just like see what our opponent has. And it's going to be uncomfortable to do so, but buckle up, put that seatbelt on uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, trust our reads that it just doesn't make sense uh, with what our opponent potentially has in this spot. Plus the thing that makes that even like easier for me to say, we, we have the nut outs. We have mm-hmm. the ability to make the nuts where we will go from feeling uncomfortable Oops. to extremely comfortable in this spot. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, that's always an added bonus. I like that. We've officially hit our first audio cue screw up of the episode. Congratulations, everybody. Um, I like what Rob was saying earlier as well, that like if this is the kind of player that's just it's gone check all the way around twice. So now they're going to be stabbing with a bunch of stuff like that. That player slows down on the river a lot and you can actually get your ace high to uh, to showdown. So that is not like you necessarily have to anticipate a bet on the river all the time. Uh, depending on what kind of frequency you think this player is taking. Uh, Steve, you unmuted again, and then we'll talk to Chris again. Yeah, I think uh, what Taylor said is is really important in that you need to understand how your how you're thinking about the game connects to the river here. Because if you're going to just check call here and then decide, unless I nail my nut flush here on the river, I'm just folding to any bet, mm-hmm. then um, – there's there's a gap in sort of your follow through there, and I think the language of this post leads me to believe that this player will probably play that way. In that, if they call the turn here, they're just folding to anything that's not a hard on the river. Um, so then I think you need to explore like what your commitment levels are, and what, when you get into spots like this, uh, are you go? What happens when the jack comes? Are you are you calling down on the river? Are you capable of doing that? You need to be sort of be aware. And writing stuff out like this is great because you you know if you follow sentence by sentence the way he describes, uh, you know what he thinks about the opponent's range and what what he thinks about, you know, will he bet work and whatever. It's it's a very um, pessimistic view on this hand <laughs> i don't think someone and i'm not trying to like whatever it is what it is like how it's written but i'm just saying like does that connect with him being able to follow through with a call on the turn in a lot of spots where it's probable i'm sorry call on the river in a lot of spots where it might be profitable even to call down ace high yep. so i don't know how you guys navigate that with with students who have that sort of gap between oh i, I feel like i I hit my nut flush draw on the turn, so maybe I'm okay to call a pot size bet here, but I'm I'm just folding to anything that's not a heart. Like, does that make that decision point on the turn um, less profitable for that student? Obviously, I think it does, but um, how does that student bridge that gap? You know what I mean? Yeah, I guess that's a good question, Chris. Uh, well, let's go back because what part of the reasons we're finding this so uncomfortable is because we checked the turn and Mm. kind of this player. I mean, I think a lot of players when they have position in these kind of spots will read checks from all their opponents, as we've already said, as you know, they'll just take a stab. It's like, okay, but, but it becomes really uncomfortable when we have hands like this. And that is one of the reasons why I think like, it's just, it's so much easier to play this through a bet. I mean, if our opponent, if our opponent on the button jams on us here, like, you know, well, okay, uh, you know, it, it's 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 not our favorite result <laughs> for sure, but 
it's okay. I mean, I think that's okay. Versus this spot, I feel is just, it's just like we're kind of we're guessing. We're just guessing now, and we're put in this real and 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 as everyone's been pointing out, if we call here, we're gonna have to guess on the river again mm-hmm. uh, unless we nail it. And it, you know, it, it's it, we're just we're just playing really difficult poker. Um, and I think it can be easier for us um, when 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 we just kind of take the lead on this on this turn here. They are they are not going to be able to raise all that often on this board into us when we bet here. They may call, they may have a better hand, but they're not going to have that many hands that can come over the top on us. Um, and so we do, I don't think we have to be wor- too worried about that when we make this bet. Yep, uh, I like that. And, and I think that being able to redraw to the nuts, I think, um, as someone mentioned earlier, is just a real nice little safety cushion available to you. Because um, sometimes uh, sometimes they are going to call with a strong hand and, and you're going to win anyway on the river. So um, you never know. You never know what that dang river is going to bring. So. Does anyone, do we want to do a, a show of hands here then? So as played, we have checked. Um, and Keith's, Keith's final question is, did I miss a bet somewhere before it got to this precarious situation that Chris is describing? And I think the, we're, we agree generally that, yeah, the, the turn is the size, the time for a bet and a pretty chunky bet um, to put some pressure on their one pair of hands. Um, as played, when it goes check, check, pot, fold and it's back to us um who's folding who's calling and who's shoving let's start at the top is anybody shoving chris is thinking about it uh who's calling on the turn I'm, taylor i'm Rob? calling yeah i'm calling yeah, steve steve's calling bob's calling and uh is anybody folding when you get the pot size bet on the river Nope, just too much too much equity with that. It, uh, like it, all options, like this is a spot where like all options are on the table, though. Like I don't want this to feel like even though we voted this way, like folding is out of the option. Like mm-hmm. no, you just had someone bet pot into you. Like folding is yeah. most definitely an option when you have ace high. However, I think there's some uh bluffing <clears throat> that's potential in our opponent's range that ace high might be good. We have a strong draw, like all those things lead me toward calling, but like any of them are very viable options. It's a it's a great game we've chosen, isn't it? <laughs> That's any 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 options uh, available. If yeah, you Rob. Think about if you think about the kind of hands that he would bet here after everybody checked him twice. There could be a lot of flush draws that we're gonna be smashing. Mm-hmm. with our ace jack i mean if he has you know an eight nine of hearts or you know you have something something weird ten eight of hearts or something like that or it can't be a t- yeah no but it ten, could be eight seven eight or something yeah because the ten okay, of hearts is yeah. out there but yeah but if they have one of those kind of hands that uh have a lot of equity but really we'd be crushing them if the heart showed up mm-hmm. and they've got all of that in their range all of that yep I like it. But what about uh, the, the size of the bet is also, it, I mean, it tells us something um, that they've chosen to go pot after everyone's just checked all their way there. That inclines me to think that it's a bit of a go away bet. And we actually have a pretty good hand to be playing against a go away range. Um, Chris, you unmuted for a second there. Uh, what else? Well, I just, mind? I'll just, uh, I, I, again, I would like to bet here rather than. Mm-hmm be in mm-hmm. this situation but if i am in this situation for some of the reasons that keith mentions you know it's hard to get paid off on a heart it's hard to um i of the options we have left i i do i would shove i would shove this um because we can probably get called by some of those worse hearts that we're ahead of mm-hmm. we can get um we're not that far behind most holdings that might call us. And we're going to put a ton of pressure on, on some hands that we're behind um, that really can't call uh, this, even if they're like, okay, everyone's showing weakness. 
I'm going to bet my second pair. Well, good luck calling this now. So I, <laughs> that's why I would be shoving. And I get that yep. we're, we, we are shoving. I mean, we're shoving into a polar bet. It's a big bet. It's a polar bet. Um, but I think this is one that's going to be skewed more towards bluffs just based on the dynamic that we've got going on. Yep. And I like that you're approaching that sort of the, one of these cardinal rules of if they're the polarized range, you don't take aggressive action into them because it allows them to play perfectly. But again, these general rules, there, there's a million general rules and sometimes they contradict each other. So it was really a question of like, what am I going to weigh uh, when it comes to making this decision? Um, Steve, we'll give you the final word. Yeah, I, I, I find it interesting that people take these passive lines, like specifically on the turn here, they take a passive line because they want to avoid sort of tough spots like, oh, what if I get ra- raised or whatever? And how do I respond with that? But then it leads you to points in the hand where you're you're faced with even more difficult decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think people overlook that a lot. I know I do. Um, now, now the, the flip side to that coin for me specifically is is – defaulting too much to the aggressive action. And I think we've learned recently in poker study, uh, you know, with the advent now of uh, solvers and stuff, how how passive it can be profitable. It can be profitable. Um, and spewing j- aggression just for the sake of aggression it is not necessarily more profitable than passivity, right? But I do think that the idea that people default to passivity because they want, they have in their minds that it makes decision making easier mm-hmm. is a fundamental floor in thought process that you see a lot in um people just trying to, uh, trying to get better at uh, understanding the game and navigate especially deeper post flop you know multiple streets post flop um where you could end up in a river decision where you're facing uh you know your tournament life in this example but you know or for all your stacks in in cash and i think it's uh, it's important to check your language. Like I think his language used in this post is really uh, informative about the way he's currently thinking about the game. And um, and if you dissect a lot of that, there's a lot of opportunity for growth here, just beyond this singular like sort of hand, you know. Yeah, great, great insight. I also really think you're right about, um, especially recreational players. We we kind of default to the passive lines because we think it like creates fewer uncomfortable positions but it really just sets you up for more uncomfortable positions later and uh and i also want you know people talk about wanting to like decrease their variance by making a hand and not getting chips into but you're actually increasing variance by taking a line like that Uh, maybe that's a subject for another podcast episode but um i yeah i'd challenge our our listeners to uh take that note from steve and sometimes you can get yourself out of trouble with the aggressive line, um, or maybe even lose less than you would uh, by taking the passive line. So don't always just uh, write it off as, uh, you know, being a spew opportunity. I think uh, taking the aggressive line can actually save you a lot of chips sometimes too. Well, uh, some fantastic insights here. Um, I'm so glad we got a couple of premium members in the room for this conversation. So thank you to Bob Franklin and uh, Steve Catterson for joining us. Um, Of course, thank you to our Wrecking Crew members, Rob Washam, Chris Jones, and Taylor Moss. Uh, Keith Monkey System Brant for the post and you the listeners for uh, getting us out of bed every morning and humming on the show so we wouldn't do it without you thanks for joining us and we'll see you next week on the Rec Poker Podcast good night everybody